I want to talk about uh, UAS. I call them unmanned aircraft systems. And uh, I recognize that some of you I know have these that you're flying around your ranches and your farms already. And uh, more of you probably are thinking about getting them. What I'm going to do today is uh, what I'd like to do is just talk about um, what I think are some applications with unmanned aircraft, talk about some of the equipment that we're using, and I'll share some ideas about um, what I think is applicable to, to farmers and ranchers. And uh, then I'll talk about what we've discovered has worked and what hasn't worked, and some important issues that uh, we go forward. And finally, I'm going to talk about, uh, I want to make sure to talk about what we're doing at NDSU uh, this uh, current year and some of the new ideas, new programs. What we're working is, is both in crops and livestock. Uh, most of what we've done so far is in, in crop production, but we're working in the areas of livestock as well. And we use a lot of different aircraft. Um, I'll just kind of go through them briefly. Um, we started really with this uh, Trimble uh, UX5, and it's a um, fixed wing. It flies for about an hour, takes uh, like uh, one section of land, square mile, uh, pictures in an hour, and uh, would fly, uh, would, you know, the pixel size would be about one square inch on the ground. And it can handle winds of up to about 40 miles an hour, so it can pretty well handle any of the winds that we're going to be working in. Uh, we always fly it crossways to the wind, uh, perpendicular to the wind. It has a regular Sony camera, but the camera uh, is, has been converted to take not just RGB, red, green, blue, but also infrared. And the cost is very high, I think. It's about $30,000 for one of those. Um, very durable, though. Um, uh, we have land, we've, the one that we have, we've flown about 50 times, and it still looks like new, so it still works good. Um, next one that we had was this... Um, 3DR rotocopter, and that we spent about two thousand dollars for. Uh, came with a, uh, actually came with just a little uh, GoPro camera. And uh, I was wondering what was going on there, taking my copy. Sorry, John. <laughs> um, but this year now, we purchased a thermal camera and a couple of other cameras for that one. Uh, the, thermal, the thermal camera uh, is an expensive camera, but it basically gives a, a pixel, I mean, a, a temperature for each pixel. So if you fly over your cattle, you'd pick out animals that have a fever. Or if you flew over a, a crop, that, like an irrigated crop, and pick out an area that's, that's moisture stressed. Uh, we had purchased this little Skywalker too. We've hardly used it. This is about uh, cost about thousand dollars, maybe even less than that. But it's a styrofoam one. But it would be a way to get started, you know. And it has a key, the camera that came with it uh, takes uh, individual pictures, and then you stitch them together when you're done. And each one has a latitude and longitude associated with it. So this will fly for about uh, twenty minutes and handle you know, 20 mile an hour winds, maybe, maybe a little less than that. Uh, the next one we got was uh, this, um, the name is not on there, it's uh, uh, RF-70 from AgPixel, a company out of Colorado. And we, we paid about $10,000 for that, and it came with a camera that uh, is similar to the Sony camera, but it, uh, the unique thing about this one, this camera, this one, it comes with a camera, and that's the only camera you can use. This one comes with something where you can exchange any kind of camera pretty much that you can put in there as long as it weighs less than about two pounds. So you can put quite a bit of stuff in there. But we'll be flying that with two cameras at the same time, so we'll take RGB, red, green, blue, and infrared imagery at the same time. Uh, for this one, you have to switch the camera and fly it twice. So that would be, that's the next one. And again, this is about a seven, about a six foot wingspan, so it's a little bit larger. Uh, again, flies for about an hour and a half, and uh, easily take uh, you know a section of land or a section and a half of land with one flight. Uh, then we purchased this uh, Phantom, which I think is probably the most common 
drone or UAV or whatever uh, around. That's what most people are starting with is a rotocopter. And uh, uh, as you see people that use them for recreational purposes or they use them for a lot of different uh, you know, uh, photographs for over, um, over family gatherings or whatever, that's probably the one you see the most. It's about, you can buy it at Best Buy uh, for about $1,000, maybe $1,200. Comes with, uh, when you buy it that way, it comes with a GoPro camera, so you can take video, or you can actually then separate out still pictures from that as well. Uh, very uh, durable, very easy to fly. This is one that, uh, this is about a six or seven foot wingspan. We actually didn't purchase this, but we worked with a company uh, called Altavian, which is a California-based company. But the unique thing about this one is that they are being built in North Dakota at, at Wapiton. They're, they're actually constructing those and selling those. But uh, Altavian is a company that uh, has done some work in the in the orchard industry in Florida, and they wanted to get into agriculture, learn about agriculture. So they flew a couple of fields for us, uh, corn field and a soybean field, and then they also flew some uh, weeds for the uh, Barnes County for a Valley City uh, weed control uh, office. So those are the aircraft that we use. Uh, not sure what this one sells for, but probably about uh, twenty-five or thirty thousand as well. Uh, These are some of the cameras that we use. And if you're going to get into this, that's the next thing to look at. You know, the easy part really is flying because, as I'll talk about later, all those aircraft are autonomous. You don't have to be sitting there flying them. I mean, you can fly them if you want, but they're all autonomous as well. But the cameras, uh, what you need is something that can, um, in most cases in agriculture, we want something that can take red, green, blue, like we see, plus we want the infrared as well, because the infrared is very usable in uh, determining health of crops. Uh, most of the cameras that I've seen, this one is only about a $100 camera, uh, and it works pretty well. It has, uh, that one you just basically uh, turn the camera on, it takes pictures every, like every second or every half second as you're flying, and so the ones before you take off, you end up deleting those, or the ones which you land, you delete those. Uh, this is the camera that uh, came with our, our uh, Trimble. This, these, these two here, and I've got kernels of corn here just to give you an idea of how big they are. They're pretty small. This is a camera that costs uh, a company out of Minneapolis called Centera that we're working with. Uh, about $5,000 for each of these cameras, so they're very expensive. But this one takes RGB and infrared at the same time, and this one takes four different bands at the same time. It's more of a research type camera. This is a thermal camera. Again, there's a penny sitting on top of it, so you can see the size of it. Uh, this camera uh, will, again, take uh, pictures. It depends on how high you fly it. But uh, if you fly it at, say, 200 feet, the pixel size would be about one square inch, and every pixel would have a temperature. So if I took a picture of you all with that, I could pick out those of you who have a fever right now. Uh, and that's the idea of flying over animals and be able to pick that up. Also, animals, and you're probably aware of that, those of you who are ranchers, that the body temperature of a, of a cow, for example, goes up about two degrees, about 36 hours before they calf. So you can fly over your herd tonight and say, oh, I better pull these off for calving because uh, the temperature is up and they're going to calve in the next few hours. This is a hyperspectral camera, again, about just a real small one. But uh, that takes, that's again a research camera that takes a lot more of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this is uh, some of the applications that I see that we're going to be using UAVs for. And, and I say going to because a lot of things that really haven't developed well enough to really to be, have them mainstream, I think, in farming and ranching. But we're, we're getting there. But I certainly think that you know, the farmers that I've talked to said that once they have one of these and can scout their fields, they just hate to not have it. You know, being able to get up above and see your crop and see the issues, the same is true with livestock. It's just nice to have. And you can do that with that, with that uh, Phantom uh, that I talked about that you can get at Best Buy for about $1,000. can do it very well. It stores the imagery, so you have it when you're done. Um, and then management issues. I think that the small UAS uh, will certainly be used to fly over a field, 
and pick out where there's weeds, what kind of weeds are there, picking out nitrogen deficiency on, on corn or soybeans or something, or wheat. So those are things that we can do very effectively with small ones uh, and, and make these precision ag maps. But I also think that we're going to see large UAVs flying around. And we're working on a project this summer where we've got one that's a 35-foot wingspan internal combustion engine that flies for like 14 hours at a time. I think we're going to see those kinds of UAS operating in North Dakota. And they'll just fly, say, all of Stark County every Monday morning and, and store it in the cloud. And then US farmers clip out what you need for 50 cents an acre or something so that you're not flying it yourself. But I, I see that happening uh, for, for a lot of different things. Uh, we're going to do yield predictions. Uh, uh, you know, when you have insect and disease movements over a region, it'd be nice to have a regular imagery, high resolution imagery. Uh, elevation data for drainage. Uh, and again, it's just one more part of big data. Uh, in terms of livestock, uh, real-time monitoring, obviously. If you can, if you're, you know, if you can fly over your, your rangeland and pick out where animals are, and whether they're moving, whether they're, uh, you know, uh, disease problems, uh, identification of problems, uh, movement, race temperatures. Uh, we're doing a project this year where we're going to read uh, RFID tags on cattle. In addition to reading their temperature, we want to be able to know which animal it is. So, uh, with the active RFID tags, not passive ones, but active ones that have a battery in them. You can read them for a couple hundred feet away. So we'll be able to fly over and not only tell you an animal has a fever, but which animal it is. Um, I just quickly uh, talk about what we're doing at NDSU. And some of this you're probably familiar with. But we started at Carrington the first year and uh, flew uh, just kind of proof of concept to see what we can do. This last year, we did some work with nutrient deficiencies in corn and soybeans. And uh, stand counting corn, we can do that with other crops too, but pretty much corn is about the one that farmers are interested in. Uh, identification of noxious weeds in, in rangeland, that was at Barnes County. This year, uh, we're going to be doing a number of things. One of them, uh, uh, first of all, uh, we're going to fly an area uh, that's 40 miles long and 4 miles wide <coughs> once a week during the growing season. So we'll have a large area. And in that area, we'll look at some specific issues with corn, soybeans, and wheat. Weed identification, uh, herbicide-resistant weeds, uh, being able to identify weeds that are herbicide-resistant, uh, detection of specific diseases. And then uh, we're going to, since we're going to use a large UAVS and small ones, we're going to compare the imagery from small, large, and satellite imagery to figure out, you know, why are we flying it with a UAV if we can do it with a satellite just as effectively. So that's our objective there. I'd like to uh, point out, and, 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 and you know, we we're doing a lot of work with UAS. And as, as citizens of the state, you probably wonder where the money comes from. Well, a lot of our money is coming through the North Dakota Department of Commerce, <clears throat> and the Department of Commerce has this program called Research North Dakota. The legislature appropriated about five million dollars for research at NDSU and UND. But we can only get that money if we match it dollar for dollar by industry. So like the project we did at Carrington the first year uh, cost us, we spent, we got $40,000 from the Department of Commerce. And this company wrote a check for another 40000 So it's kind of the wisdom of our legislature is they're forcing us at, at, at the universities to work with industry and get real dollars. It's not matching dollars. It's real money that they contribute. Uh, this year, we worked with uh, Altavian, and then we worked with uh, the Soybean Council and the Corn Council, uh, and uh, with this company called Centera, which is a Minneapolis company. But at any rate, all of those funds are matched dollar for dollar, so we're kind of doubling the tax money in North Dakota. This year, we'll be working with uh, four large, a small U.S. project and one large one. And again, the large one I'll talk about at the end of the program, but it's a company called Elbit Systems of America. Our objectives on our work is to look at how you can use different kinds of cameras, uh, color, thermal, and infrared cameras, both crops and livestock. But since our money comes from the Department of Commerce, a lot of it, 
you know, our objective is to see what's usable. What's, what's the return on investment? Is this something that's profitable or, or usable on a farm level or whoever else is using it? And then since I work in extension, we work in that area too. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we found and some of the things that we found that worked, some of the things that didn't work. And this picture, as farmers, you recognize this, but this is a picture of corn with nitrogen deficiency. This is corn with sulfur deficiency, and this is corn with excess moisture. They all cause yellowing, okay? So can you fly over a field and say, oh, this is nitrogen deficiency, or a fly over a field and say, no, this isn't nitrogen, this is sulfur deficiency. And, and just, I just use this as, a, as an example of how difficult it is. We'd like to be able to say we can do that, but here the yellowing occurs on the older leaves, on sulfur it occurs on the younger leaves, and on excess moisture, the whole, there's chlorosis over the whole plant. And, and, and that's an issue, and I think that we, um, especially if you have some company coming to you and say, I can use my, you know, my drone to fly over your field and I can tell you exactly what the problem is. I think we have a ways to go yet. Um, Another thing that we find is that, um, you know, this is about the size of a football field, but it's about 20 pictures that have been stitched together. And we're still finding that this is a picture of the original image, and this is the mosaic that's put together of all the pictures, you know, because you take all these pictures over a quarter section of land, you might take, say, 500 pictures. So then you have the computer software put them together, and everything we do causes some deterioration in clarity. And, and so that's an issue. Uh, and part of the reason is that we're using uh, uh, just a, a WASP GPS. We need an RTK GPS, I think, to be more accurate. But at any rate, that's an issue. Um, this just shows a picture of uh, what you might see from the pictures that we're taking. You can see a lot, whoops, a lot of detail here and uh, be able to pick out uh, you know, we actually do stand counts from this. This is another picture that uh, uh, just shows the value of an infrared image. This is an infrared <coughs> image and this is a green image of the same area. Again, this was taken at Carrington, about, uh, about, one, about the size of a football field, one acre. But here you can see less than what you can see. So the infrared image, and again, if you get that over your crop, you get to see you know, quite a bit of, of uh, detail that you would miss with just a regular image. This is a uh, picture that, of an irrigated uh, uh, cornfield uh, in, in, uh, by Steel, North Dakota. And this just shows an area where the fertilizer, uh, for some reason, had shut off. And, and uh, it's kind of one of the things that I want to point out. But it kind of shows up in an NDVI. You have to evaluate uh, very effectively. This is something that. Uh, that we find that we can do very accurately, and that's to do a stand count in corn. You know, as a farmer, you plant maybe 30,000 seeds per acre, or maybe a little fewer than that. Uh, and, and you're hoping that every plant, you know, comes up and produces a cob of corn, and when you harvest it, each one has a cob of corn on it. Well, it, you know, if you can fly over your field, say, a week after it comes out of the ground, and you find that, you know, that this area doesn't have 30,000 plants coming, it only has 10,000 plants coming out of the ground, you'd probably be able to manage that differently. Especially if you're doing uh, in-season, you know, side dressing of corn. Uh, what we did is we we had uh, researchers go out and put flags out in the ground, uh, one meter by two meters, and uh, then uh, they went out and actually counted those. And we flew them, and our numbers are statistically the same as their numbers, so we're able to do that and do it, you know, in just a you know, few minutes. Um, this shows uh, being able to, to uh, do a yield prediction in corn. And here we were doing at Carrington in the middle of July, doing a yield prediction of corn so that you could fly over your field and say it's going to yield, uh, with about 90% accuracy, it's going to yield you know, 140 bushels to the acre, or it's going to yield 120 bushels to the acre. So valuable information from a grower point of view if you can do that. And again, with infrared images, it can be done effectively. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, irrigated uh, uh, sugar beets. I don't have the statistics with this or the data, but basically this one shows a little bit greener and, and the, the, they were able to do a correlation to the amount of water that was applied to the different plots. 
Um, this is a field, a picture that was taken. We're actually looking for a noxious weed on this one. But I thought it was kind of interesting. This was a soybean field. And uh, to see some of the issues that the grower was having with his, his planter that uh, maybe uh, probably wouldn't want me showing the picture. But at any rate, uh, it's things that you can pick up once you get over the field. Uh, one of the, th the things we were doing with this uh, imagery was to try to find uh, a noxious weed, purple loose stripe, uh, and we were able to effectively do that. I don't have the statistics on that either. Uh, in terms of monitoring animals, this just shows uh, a picture of sheep in, in a field. And again, if you tell the computer that this is, a, this is one animal, it then can go count the rest of them very, I know, pretty much instantly. So uh, being able to fly over, and, and be able to, to do that, you know, where you're not counting them yourself, but the computer is doing the counting for you. Uh, this is a, a picture of one of the projects we're doing. We're kind of looking forward to this. Just started it in the greenhouse, but being able to identify weeds. And this is just simply picking out uh, a uh, wild buckwheat and then telling the computer to go find all the other ones. And it does it with each particular. This is a uh, wild oats, and I think there's some pig weed in here. At any rate, we're able to do that. Another thing that I think is maybe more, has more future, but being able to identify weeds on a field is, is valuable too, from especially the amount of infestation. But here we're looking at herbicide resistant weeds, and I've got one student doing this, and, and the, this is just greenhouse work but at this point, but we'll be doing it with, with the UAV this summer. It's using the thermal camera, and we're finding that if you take, let's just say kochia, weed, or wild oats, and you, we plant them both in the greenhouse, one that's resistant to herbicide, one that's susceptible. Okay, and then we let them grow to you know three inches high or whatever to your time to apply the Roundup, and you apply it, and <clears throat> what we're finding is that those weeds that are susceptible to the herbicide, say 10 hours later, are starting to die. And so they have less water in their cells. And as the sun shines on them, they can't cool correctly. And so the canopy temperature of those weeds that are susceptible to the herbicide is warmer. And those weeds that are resistant to herbicides, they're still healthy yet, so they have the right amount of water in their cells. So they have a lower canopy temperature. So the idea would be that uh, we would fly over a field after a farmer applies his Roundup, or whatever other chemical, and with the, since each picture has you know latitude and longitude, we could say, you know, here's some herbicide resistant weeds that your chemical didn't get. So given the issue that we have with herbicide resistant weeds, the increasing problem, I see this as something that's very effective. And it's not something you could do, you know, with satellite imagery. It's not something you could probably do with, with high aerial imagery because you need that high resolution. But uh, what this basically shows, this is a susceptible uh, kochia plant, and this is a resistant one. And if you can see the numbers, there's about two degrees difference Fahrenheit after you apply the herbicide to the weeds that are dying compared to those that are susceptible. Um, uh, this is just another picture of the same thing, but uh, this is a picture of livestock with that thermal camera. And uh, the, the whiter the temperature, the higher, the whiter the color, the higher the temperature. And then you can focus in and, and uh, ask the, ask the, have the computer uh, actually put a unique temperature on every pixel. So then you take the, all the pixels from one cow and average it, and that would be their body temperature. So being able to pick out animals with a fever. Uh, one of the things that we haven't done yet, but will do, is use imagery to count animals. And again, that is, it's, it's probably going to be harder than we think, because when you look at a picture like this, you know, the computer has to tell that this is two cows, you know, a cow and a calf. Is it able to do that? So we'll see. Uh, so issues, um, I think uh, if, if I was a farmer or rancher and getting into buying one of these, I'd probably start at something, you know, a couple thousand dollars or less. But the one thing I would make sure is that it has an autopilot associated with it. So it has GPS with it. So that you're not sitting there flying it yourself. You know, when I fly like that, the, the, uh, the Trimble, you know, when I fly that, it's easy. You know, you just 
you just uh, launch it, and you just sit down and have a cup of coffee, and, and when it's done flying, it comes and backs and lands beside you. But that one of the rotocopters, every time I try flying it, I get it off the ground fine, but every time I try to land it, you know, it's hard to keep straight. So if I let the computer do it, it's fine. If I do it, it seems like I'm always breaking something on it. And I think that's the key, is, is have an autopilot so you don't have to do the flying. Now, you're going to have to be able to, I'm going to talk about the FAA regulations, you're always going to, at least in the near term, you're going to have to be able to control it. So you do have to be able to interact with them, but you want the computer to do the flying as much as possible. Uh, as I indicated, I think we're, we're going to need the agronomist because there's a lot of issues that are just too difficult to say for sure what it is. Uh, the sensors and cameras, uh, to me, uh, they're being developed, they're constantly being made smaller, and the price is coming down. But you need a camera that can take both color and infrared. Uh, it'd be nice to get thermal as well. Uh, data transfer is a big issue. Uh, when we fly a quarter section of land <coughs> and, uh, in 20 minutes, we'll get probably two gigabytes of data. So when you think about that, but, you know, for those of you who are familiar with, you all use cell phones and, and computers, and you know that you can send an email, and if you put 10, 10 megabytes on there, you, your email goes. If I put 20 megabytes, my email doesn't get delivered because our system won't handle that. And so we're not talking megabytes here, we're talking gigabytes, a thousand times this big. So data transfer is an issue. Uh, data management, uh, we're finding that it, our computers, you know, instead of using a $500 computer, we're probably going to be using a $2,000 computer to make this work in a few minutes rather than a few hours. Um, a lot of different software out there. We have the trouble with image degradation that, that maybe we can solve. And then we, um, because we're using a WAS the GPS, it's only accurate to about a couple of meters. Our, our images aren't as accurate as they should be. And in the end, you know, you're, you're interested not in imagery, but in analysis. You're interested in, you know, which cow has a fever or how much nitrogen do I have to put on here? And, and so uh, I think that's, that's a, an issue that we need to work with yet. Uh, from a legal point of view, might as well go through this, things haven't changed a lot. The FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, still has some pretty severe regulations for us. You know from just watching the news or reading the newspaper that starting in December this past year, you have to register. You know, you can buy any UAV you want, just like you can buy any car you want. But you can't drive that car up and down the highways in North Dakota if you don't register it. The same is true with the UAV now. You can buy it, but you have to register it. And it doesn't make any difference whether you use it for fun or whether you use it commercially. You have to register it. It costs $5. You do it online. You can, the first month, now I think it's free, but then it'll be $5. Uh, and the purpose of that, of course, is FAA wants to know if you crash into somebody, whose aircraft is it, you know? If you fly it in the White House's lawn, whose is it, you know? And uh, I guess that's pretty reasonable. Anyway, uh, to do that, we're accustomed to that kind of registration in other, like I say, with cars. So we, we might as well get used to it with this one. Right now, if you're going to do it commercially, and the FAA has this called commercial exemption, for some reason they all, it's a regulation number, they call it 333. You have to, if you're going to do it legally on your farm, you have to have this commercial exemption. It takes about 60 days to get it, you apply for it online, uh, it's, it's very easy, but you still need a private pilot's license to do this. Now, I know that people all over the United States and all over North Dakota are doing it without. And I understand that. But the point is that, to, according to the FAA, you do need that. You need a, a medical certificate or a driver's license. And the reason they let you use a driver's license is you can't get a driver's license without having good eyesight. Okay, so that's really what they're looking at. You have to stay under 500 feet, not a problem. Visual line of sight means you have to be able to see it. So for me, that's about a half a mile. <coughs> um, you have to be able to control it. But again, that's, they all come with that, that ability. You have to stay away from airports, uh, five miles away. And you can go closer to airports if you have permission from the airport. And by the way, an airport, if you're thinking the right legally the way the FAA is, 
an airport is not just the one here in Dickinson, but if you have a, as a farmer have your own aircraft and you have a little runway, that's an airport. So you can't fly within five feet, of 500, you have to be 500, five miles away from that. Unless again, you have to have permission from the airport to go closer to that, not hard to get. Best stay away from gatherings of people. They don't say what a gathering is. Uh, it has to be under 55 pounds, not a problem, and you can't eat it any time there's an issue about who has the right of way. Obviously, the manned aircraft always has the right of way. These regulations, I think, will change this year. In 2016, the FAA says they're going to do that. And I suspect the first thing that will disappear is this top thing. I don't think we're going to have to have a pilot's license as soon as the FAA gets this under control. But you will have to have some kind of a license. You'll probably have to do something like a driver's license. Um, I'd like to talk just briefly to end, well, I've got about three or four slides, on our project that we're doing with the large UAS. This one is, this aircraft is a 35 foot wingspan, internal combustion engine, and uh, flies for, like I said, about 14 hours at a time. At 8,000 feet, it'll take uh, 50,000 acres an hour. And it will fly, it will, that'll be about three inch pixel size on the ground. Um, we're going to do a project um, near Hill, between Hillborough and Cooperstown. Uh, we're going to fly 100,000 acres once, uh, either once a week or twice a week during the growing season at 3,000 feet, 5,000, and 8,000 feet to try to do a comparison of which one is more effective. Uh, and at the same time, we'll use small UAS to fly not the whole 100,000 acres, but maybe 10 fields so we can make a comparison at 400 feet. Then we're going to use satellite imagery of that whole area at the same time and make a comparison of all of those. And then we'll collect some ground data as well. Uh, this is the area that we're going to fly, for those of you familiar with what, eastern North Dakota. Uh, this is uh, the eastern part, of the, or the eastern part of the state. This is uh, I-29. This is Hillsboro. And Cooperstown would be over here. Uh, Jamestown would be down here somewhere. Uh, 40 miles long, 4 miles wide. Uh, there's uh, 160 square miles in there, and there's uh, 104,000 acres. We're going to fly that on a regular basis to uh, look at uh, in-season fertility, uh, weed identification, yield estimates, and then um, and we'll share this, cap this with any farmer or landowner that owns land in that area. Uh, at the same time, each week we'll have students go out there and collect uh, some ground data. We'll be running some uh, green seekers over those individual fields. And then, of course, we'll collect yield data from farmers that are willing to share it with us. So uh, it's kind of a fun project, but I put that in there because I think, I think that there's a future in this. I know this company is called Elbit Systems of America. And the aircraft, you can look it up on the internet, it's Hermes 450 currently used in Israel and in about 50 other countries around the world too, but primarily in the Middle East for in warfare. You know, they, they, deliver, they deliver bombs with it and they do, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, scouting things, uh, taking imagery. But it, it's flown uh, from a ground control station. This will be at the Hillsborough Airport. It's about, well, you can see the size of it based on the size of a person. There'll be three people sitting in there all the time flying the aircraft. Um, but again, since it's going 40 miles away and the FAA still requires line of sight, we're going to have to fly a manned aircraft in formation with it all the time. So there'll be a Cessna 150 flying with it all the time. Now that takes away the economics of it, obviously, but you know, in the future that's not going to have to be. But right now we have to have a visual observer flying within a half a mile of that aircraft all the time. Um, and uh, we use a lot of different sensors in it, uh, kind of looking forward to the project. But I think that we're going to be, uh, this is kind of going to be a ground or, or just a, a whole game changer for FAA, I mean, for the, for the unmanned aircraft. <laughs> this is where we'll fly and collect large imagery. You know, this, this aircraft could fly this county in, in about uh, five hours and get imagery of the whole area. That's just as good as these small UAVs. I think there's going to be a future for small ones. Individually, we're going to be using those. 
as I indicated, but I think there's also a future for large ones, and, and we'll see. But I encourage you to pay attention to this one during the summer and see what happens to it. Um, we're still in the process of, of uh, getting uh, permission. The FAA is in, in almost, there are, there's a five-stage uh, application, and we're in stage three and stage five to get this approved. So we expect to start flying about the 1st of May, uh, and hopefully uh, have some success throughout the year. So with that, uh, I don't know if there's any questions. Can we turn the lights on? Okay. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Do we have to get permit to uh, fly that area from the landowners? Yeah, do we have to get permission to fly from the landowners? <laughs> yes. We don't have to, but we are. I sent a letter to every one of the landowners. I went to the uh, Steel County and... Uh, Steel and, 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 and uh, whichever county Hillsborough is in, and uh, Trail County. Went to the tax offices in each county, I got a list of all the landowners and sent them all a letter. There's 518 landowners in there. Any of you in there? I know we own land, you know, people own land in different places. And we <clears throat> told them what we're going to do. We told them that uh, when we're going to do it, and we told them. Uh, if you want the imagery, you can have it on a weekly basis. We'll share it with you. And finally, we told them that if you don't want your land picture taken pictures of, we can opt out of that. We can put a little boundary in the camera that will turn off the camera when it goes over your land. And I always tell people when I've had, I had public meetings out there, and I would say, I don't want to do that because it's a big hassle. Because if you've got 20 acres there and we're flying at 8,000 feet, every picture is one square mile. So we'd lose a whole square mile just to take your 20 acres off. But anyway, big good question because we had, in the public meetings, we had a lot of issues brought up. Privacy was a big issue. But another issue, and a more important issue, there was about five or six pilots in both, private pilots in both meetings that we had. And the private pilots are real concerned about this. But this aircraft, when we fly it, will be just like a manned aircraft. The FAA will know where it's at all the time. And all, if you're a private pilot, all you have to do is tune into your radio to the FAA and you can figure out where it's at all the time.